All right, you've made it this far. You are at the last of the five parts on phylogenetic reconstruction. Hang in there, we're almost done. All right, what I'd like to do here is talk about some of the issues with real data um, and what we can do about it. The first problem is simply that the number of combinations of trees becomes really enormous, even with a relatively small number of species or taxa that we're working with. Um, this chart here shows how fast the number of unrooted trees goes up. Um, as you know already, when you've got four species, uh, you end up with three unrooted trees, five species is 15, and so forth. And it goes up extremely quickly. Um, if you do the bonus video, you'll see why this goes up so fast. The formula for it uh, is a power formula. It's, it's very similar to like a summation series, except that this is a power series where you multiply the different elements together. Um, and so this is why it goes up so fast, because we're multiplying these values as we go up. Again, you should see the bonus video if you want to understand this in more detail. So what can we do about this? Well, here's the issue. When you're working uh, with real data, um, we can only search exhaustively, and what I mean by that is look literally at every single topology for about 30 species. If you're working with more than 30 species, there's just not enough computational power out there to search exhaustively through all the possible trees. And so instead, uh, we do something uh, in computer science referred to as heuristics. And the idea is to search through all of the tree space without looking at every single tree, but search in a way that allows us to find a really good solution, even though we can't guarantee it's going to be the absolute best solution. And there's a bunch of tricks and ways to do this. I'm not going to get into them. Uh, if you're interested, you're certainly welcome to talk to me about them. So here's an example of where this uh, was the case. Um, there was a human mitochondrial tree done. Uh, 189 human beings had their complete mitochondria sequenced. And it resulted in 135 unique mitochondrial types. So even though 189 people were sequenced, only 135 unique mitochondrial sequences were found. And one run uh, of this on a computer using a heuristic technique suggested an African origin for human beings. Other runs actually showed other origins. Now we know that the African origin is correct because more data has been collected since then. But at the time, there was no way to be sure that the African origin was the correct one because uh, it, was, uh, it was equally parsimonious with other possibilities. And here is what that tree looked like. Um, you may not have seen trees like this. Imagine taking a phylogenetic tree like we've seen before and basically bending it into a circle. The root of the tree is here where we're looking uh, at the base of the tree and uh, that if you follow your way out, it would be just like an ordinary phylogenetic tree. Let's go back here. So here you can see this was one of the trees that had uh, an African origin. As you can see, you had the Western Pygmies, African Americans, Eastern Pygmies, and other groups that were coming from Africa uh, being the most ancestral forms of, uh, of the human mitochondrion. All right. What other problem might you have? Well, another problem is that you need at least as many informative sites uh, as you do taxa in order to get a completely resolved tree. And usually it's better to have more. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, the idea is simply that you can only resolve relationships if there's a change along the branch leading up to that, uh, leading up to that group. And if there's no change on that branch, then everything collapses into what we call a polytomy. I'll show you that in a second. Now, if we look at the mitochondrial sequences, it turns out, uh, using parsimony, there were only what we called 119 informative sites. That is, ones where it would tell us that there had been a change on a branch, even though there were 135 unique mitochondria. So what that means is, at most, we could resolve 119 of those relationships, but not all 135 of them. Another problem is that you can have several results that are compatible with the evidence, uh, and that's just because there aren't enough sites to distinguish them. Now let's look at where that happened on here. Where are the polytomies? Well, here's an example. If we look over here at this group from Papua New Guinea, 
Notice that you've got uh, about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different uh, individual mitochondria all coming out of the same node. And that's because <clears throat> there was no information that would distinguish what the order of events should be amongst those. There are other ones, like over here, here's another set where there's a polytomy. Here's another set where there's a polytomy. And that's simply because there weren't enough differences in the sequences to allow resolution of those relationships. And a final problem, uh, particularly when you're working with DNA, is you have to pick a molecule that evolves at an appropriate rate. Remember we talked before about the fact that when you're working with DNA sequence data, there's a 25% chance that uh, at any one position, things will match just completely by chance because there's only four possibilities at any position in a sequence. And if you get completely randomized sequences, a quarter of the bases will match each other just by chance. So to avoid this problem, we try to pick DNA sequences that don't evolve so fast that we're getting randomized uh, differences amongst those when we do our alignment. So that would be picking something that's too fast. We also don't want to pick something that's too slow because something that's too slow will have the problem that we just saw previously where you don't have enough information to resolve all the relationships. Okay, you've made it. This is the end of the, uh, the set of slides on, on phylogeny. Congratulations.